Simple, small choices. We all make thousands of those every day. And like me, you've probably heard that those choices have the power to change our lives. But who really thinks about that? I will be the first to admit it's not something I ever thought a lot about until small choices was all I had and changed my life forever. So imagine my mates and I, we've just finished a military training exercise, successfully completing another step on the pathway to our dreams. The last week's been filled with challenges. We've had all sorts of things thrown at us and instructors have observed and assessed our ability to lead. Thankfully we've passed and now we're boarding the buses to head back to the Australian Defence Force Academy. A good mate of mine has saved me a seat on the first bus, but there's no room for my gear underneath it, so I choose to get on the second bus instead. Climbing aboard, I choose a seat, sink into it, and the bus then sets off. Never do I expect the consequences of those choices. About halfway through the trip, there's a sharp swerve to the right. Now everything is rolling rapidly to the left, and I am along for the ride. The bus has rolled over and now is lying sprawled across a quiet country road. With a surge of panic and adrenaline, I push myself up to try and get out of the bus and get to safety, but I'm stuck. My left hand is pinned to the road by the side of the bus. Now I realise. In those last split seconds, my life has just drastically changed. As pain starts to sink in, one clear question screams into my mind, what on earth do I do now? As the other buses in the convoy arrive at the scene, I begin to hear people entering the wreck. Taking action, they save my life. For me, nothing matters anymore, except the choices I have to make in this moment or in the next 10 seconds to try and stay alive. Simple, small choices. Number one, focus on my breathing. Breathe in, breathe out, repeat. Number two, listen to what those around me are telling me to do and try my best to remain calm. My goal is simple, arrive at hospital with a pulse. I figure if I can achieve that, the chances are that I'll live. After nearly two hours trapped in that bus, I'm loaded onto a helicopter and flown to hospital. And thanks to the efforts of so many people, I achieve that first goal. Only to be confronted with a choice that I never thought I'd have to make. As the doctors are preparing me for surgery, they ask me if they can amputate my hand. As the weight of that choice starts to hit home, I look them in the eye and I give them my answer. Yes. Emerging from the first surgery, I see my parents by my bedside and now both my arms heavily covered in bandages, my left arm shorter than my right. And as the anesthetic wears off, it becomes clear that they've amputated my hand. What isn't so clear is how I'm ever supposed to confront the challenges that now lie in front of me. A few mornings later, I wake up early. My hospital room is dark and quiet, and there's just the beeping of the machines by my bedside. It doesn't stay that way for long. My mind seizes that opportunity to kick into overdrive. What did I do to deserve this? This wasn't part of the plan. My life, my dream, it's over. I'm only 20 years old. What am I supposed to do now? For so much of my life, I've been so focused and driven on my childhood dream of becoming a fighter pilot. I had poured everything into it. And now, stuck in this hospital bed, a dark and painful reality is starting to sink in. They haven't just amputated my hand, they've amputated my dream. I hit rock bottom. I'm filled with uncertainty about what my life is gonna look like and I'm questioning if I will ever achieve anything. Now I'm doing my life with only one hand. In the back of my mind, there's this growing fear and dread that I may never fly again. That little voice in my head is saying all sorts of unhelpful things like, who are you kidding? One-handed people don't fly planes. As sunlight begins to fill the hospital room, thankfully my thinking starts to change. I can't go back. I can't go back and choose a different seat on the bus or stop the bus rolling over. That's, that's history. Likewise, choosing to get angry or frustrated with the driver, well, that won't bring my hand back either. About the only thing I can control is my recovery. And it becomes clear that I have a very simple choice. I can get better or I can get bitter, but I've got to get to work. So my family and I, we turn to the best resource available. We turn to the internet. 
and Googling away, we find a common and recurring theme, resilience. The Cambridge Dictionary defines resilience as the ability of a substance to return to its usual shape after being bent, stretched, or pressed. And straight away, that sounds like a perfect description of exactly what my left hand has been through, but it will never return to its usual shape. It's gone. So digging deeper, we find the American Psychological Association, which states that psychologists define resilience as the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, threats, or significant sources of stress. Clearly, I need as much resilience as I can get, but to me, that seems like something only other people have. Inspiring people on TV, sports stars, elite athletes, not everyday people like me. Now I'm face to face with this adversity, far greater than I've ever imagined. How am I supposed to be resilient? Thankfully, I've discovered that we don't have to be superheroes or even superhuman to overcome challenges and achieve resilience. In fact, we have a capacity for that already. A key step to being resilient is something that all of us are capable of, making one consistent small choice at a time. I believe that no matter what challenges we face, there's always a choice of some sort. They don't have to be massive choices. They can be small things, like focusing our breathing, asking for help, or trying whatever tasks are in front of us just one more time. As I come to see my recovery in this way, maybe that's the answer. Maybe my journey back to a somewhat normal life, as scary and as impossible as that seems in this moment, maybe that's just gonna be one small choice and action at a time. All of the essential things like learning to shower, to feed myself, to get dressed, through to things like writing, typing, and even texting. Actually, the choices start out even smaller than that. One of the first tasks the doctors set me in my recovery is to fart. And that's a massive perspective shift. Almost overnight, my goals have gone from things like pass my uni exams and learn to fly some of the most technologically advanced aircraft in the world to something as simple as a fart. Talk about small choices. I can safely say that in my life, success and progress has never smelt so bad before and I hope it never does again. But now my family and I are celebrating that fart like I've just won a gold medal at the Olympics. But it's that one small choice in action that kickstarts my journey to recovery. A few months later, I attend my first prosthetic appointment. And within what seems like minutes, I have a hand like this one sitting on a desk and it's opening and closing as I'm flexing muscles in my residual limb. I feel like the Terminator. I'm almost invincible. I'm gonna have two hands again. Anything will now be possible. And in my mind, I'm having all sorts of crazy thoughts like step aside, Maverick. I'll be flying jets in no time. Not quite. Very quickly, occupational therapy becomes my life. And as I come to learn, it's gonna be a lot tougher. My occupational therapist has all sorts of simple and straightforward tasks for me to do. Things like putting pegs in a pegboard or even simpler yet, picking up a ball. Easy, right? I haven't failed more before in my lifetime. It's like I'm being asked to pick up one grain of sand using some sort of high-tech robotic chopsticks that I have absolutely no idea how to use. So often I pick up the ball, then almost get it back to the safety of my right hand before the ball and the prosthetic have other ideas. We all know what it's like to drop the ball from time to time. Things don't always go to plan and sometimes it's not even our fault. Life throws curveballs at us, setbacks strike, and the next thing you know, you end up like me, standing here, staring at the ball, wondering why it didn't work and questioning if we're ever going to succeed. But each time I drop that ball, again, I've got another small choice. On one hand, I can let the ball win, throw my hands in the air and just give up, but I don't have that option. If I can't do something as simple as pick up a ball, how am I gonna look after myself day to day, let alone chase my goals and my dreams and hopefully return to the air? Or I can bend down, pick up the ball and try again, one more time. Small choices are powerful. That doesn't mean they're easy. I've made my share of bad choices and at times have questioned if my choices are even leading me anywhere. 
With time and discipline, months of small choices allowed my biggest challenges to become a solid foundation for even bigger and crazier goals. I returned to the air, completed my degree and graduated, achieved my commercial pilot's license, became a flying instructor, and now I'm incredibly lucky. I get to fly aerobatics whenever I get the chance. The other powerful lesson that I've learned through using small choices to achieve resilience is that our situation and our setbacks don't determine our story. Let me give you an example. Prior to the accident, nobody would have considered me an athlete, not even me. I'd begrudgingly get in the swimming pool at the school sports car and despite my best efforts at the athletics, trust me, I wasn't a standout there either. I was never destined to be an athlete. Then during my recovery, I get given this form to apply for adaptive sporting events, such as the Invictus Games. What an incredible opportunity. I may have lost my hand and my dream in that accident, but now I have this new and exciting avenue that I can explore. Despite the strong story I have in my mind about my own athletic abilities, again, I make a small choice. I fill out the form, submit it, and take a massive step outside my comfort zone. But I'm glad I did. Very quickly, I become immersed in this incredibly diverse yet supportive team. And despite the challenges that my teammates and I face, we're improving ourselves and each other through sport. It's infectious. Those teammates help me to understand the healing power of sport. No matter how chaotic everything in my life is, that simple decision to show up for training is one that I can always control. Every time I go an extra meter or a split second faster, that is a victory. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen every time though. At times, my arm falls off in the middle of a row, yet remains firmly bolted to the handle, trying to smack me in the face as I desperately try to keep rowing. More embarrassingly, I faceplant on a track at a competition in front of spectators just weeks before the Invictus Games. Who would have thought that a bruised ego hurts more than losing a hand? Nursing that bruised ego, and with the help of friends and coaches, again, I revert back to small choices. And I focus on every single detail. How do I get into the blocks? Which foot hits the ground first after the starter goes? And more importantly, how do I run this race without falling over? That seems kind of important. A few weeks later at the Invictus Games, it's time to put those choices to the test. Walking out onto the track and seeing the stands full of spectators, I can sense my heart starting to beat faster in my chest. As I approach the blocks and crouch down, the nerves start to rise as the race is now set. In seconds, the starter goes and I sense movement to my left and my right as we all explode forward out of the box at once and take off down the straight. And the result is something I never expect. Somehow I cross that finish line first, but far more importantly and powerful to me is the fact that I did that without falling over. Those small choices paid off. I owe a lot to small choices. Small choices put me in that seat on that bus and drastically changed my life. Simple, small choices then became the stepping stones to my recovery and my resilience. Consistent, small choices, starting with some breaths, followed by a fart, transformed that tragic accident into some of the most incredible and amazing opportunities I could have ever imagined. And we all have that ability. All of us can make small choices and transform or rewrite our stories. Be it in our personal lives, in our communities, or even in a broader global sense. Not only can we be resilient, but we can all transform our toughest times and our toughest challenges into some of the most greatest opportunities that we can ever expect. And do you want to know what the most exciting and best part about that is? is that we've all start making those choices today. Thank you.